Thank you for, uh, thank you for having me do the keynote. Uh, we're about to discover uh, what a terrible, terrible mistake that was. But um, I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully it's good. Um, I wanted to talk about the cake pattern. Okay. Um, now, the cake pattern is something that was, um, I believe, named as a pattern by um, John Preddy in a paper like, I don't know, seven years ago. I mean, this is a fairly old thing. It's been around in Scala pretty much as long as traits have. Um, but uh, it, wasn't really, it wasn't really talked about in the mainstream or really used in the mainstream until um, Jonas Bonaire's uh, blog post on how you could do dependency injection with a cake pattern. And I thought it was a really good blog post. And this was like four years ago now. And um, uh, just a quick show of hands, how many people have read Jonas's dependency injection blog post? All right, good, good, good. Um, it's, a, it's a good post. Old version of Scala, but it's good. Um, I am here to tell you that that description of the cake pattern is woefully inadequate because there's so many things that the cake pattern can do for you that are not really dependency injection. In fact, using it for dependency injection is like this tiny little backwater of the cake pattern, and it's, it's really only a very small part of the larger picture. So um, what do I mean when I talk about the cake pattern? Well, I mean things like this, okay? So um, I apologize for those of you on this side who maybe can't see the bottom of the screen. I didn't realize there was gonna be asymmetries, so um, yeah. Uh, so we've got a user module, right? And uh, the user module has a function that allows you to load a user, which is something. And then there's a tweet module that allows you to do things. And um, then there's a MySQL user module that implements user module. And then a Twitter module, because as every social media startup will tell you, there's more than just Twitter for tweeting. And um, the, the Twitter module uses both the tweet module and user module. And you notice that it's using user module in an abstract form. It's not, using the, it's not depending on the details of MySQL um, to do this. Um, and then finally, at the end of the universe, we put everything together um, in, in this, this giant cake we call universe, new MySQL user module with Twitter module, and everything goes together, the dependencies line up, and the compiler will check to make sure that we actually have an implementation of load user and an implementation of post, because those are the things that we need to be able to do stuff with this. So this is kind of like the, the, essence, the essence taste of the cake pattern, but there's a lot more to it. Um, and what we're going to talk about is um, basically four different things here. Um, we're going to talk about some of the type theory that goes just very, very briefly um, that uh, underlies the cake pattern and uh, makes all of this stuff come together. Um, and we're going to mostly we're just going to talk about modules. Uh, modules are what the cake pattern is all about. It's all about modularity and modularity in a way that isn't really supported by any other mainstream languages. There are other languages that have modularity to this extent, but nobody cares about them because they're all sort of off in esoterica somewhere. Um, and then the, um, we're going to talk about some of the problems that arise when you do this. Um, you know, the cake pattern is really amazing. It's a, a very powerful way of doing abstraction and organizing your code base, but um, fundamentally we're taking something that's very, very, very powerful um, and uh, very, very extensively, extensive in its implications, and we're applying it to a platform, i.e. the JVM, which is extremely limited. And that gives rise to some really, really, really weird quirks that will bite you hard every time you use the cake pattern. Um, and then finally, some best practices for keeping things sane. Um, so hopefully this, is, uh, hopefully this is interesting. Type theory. Um, here is a class. I'm sure this is a revelation to everyone. Um, this class has a field in it, x, which is supplied in the constructor. It's a private field, which is significant. And then it has a function, which takes a y, and then returns a new value using that x. Now stop and think about that for a second. We do this so much every day. This seems extremely prosaic. But if you think about it, something very odd is going on here. You can give someone a foo, okay? They have a foo, which means they have a function add from int to int. And that function add uses something that is inside foo, something that is not visible to you who gave them that function. Okay? This is really, really interesting. Now, you could call this partial application, and in fact it is. Um, but what's, what's really significant about this is there's a piece of data, there's a piece of state, not mutable state, but state, that is inside this object and hidden and passed implicitly to the add function as a hidden first parameter, the this pointer, uh, every time we call the add function. So this turns out to actually be very, very interesting. And it steps on an interesting core dichotomy 
in the fundamentals of higher order logic. And of course, higher order logic is higher order types. So universal types. Everybody's familiar with the concept of a universal type, or at least you know, most of us are, right? These are standard generics, right? You have a function that takes some type parameter A. Maybe it's inferred, maybe not. It actually doesn't matter from a theoretical standpoint. And that function is just defined for all A, right? So we've got this trait for all, apply. You know, apply to A, give me an option of A. Um, obviously, a couple different ways you could implement this, but it doesn't matter. Um, just like focus on the type signatures. So this is a for all. Now, those of you who know logic know that in addition to universal quantification, there's this concept called existential quantification. So universal quantification says, for all A, T of A is true. Existential quantification says, for some A, we know not what, T of A is true. Not for all, for some. This is a really profound duel. Really, really profound. So here's, here's kind of what it looks like in Scala. We've got um, an exist trait. And then instead of A being a parameter on apply, A is actually a type inside of exists, OK? And so if we have something of type exists inside our function bippy, right, um, then uh, there's that apply method that we could try to use. But the problem is that it's not going to work. So unlike for all, where we're free to give any type, any type instantiation to A, and it's guaranteed to be correct because it says for all A, here we have for some. For some, we know not what. We don't know what A is. Therefore, this can't be valid, because we don't, we, the compiler can't prove that A is, in fact, an int. So um, it turns out there's actually no valid type that you can stick in here. You cannot call the apply method on exists, which is, seems useless. Um, the, the core realization here, um, the core thing that allows us to get this sort of useless situation, which is, in fact, very useful, as I'll talk about in a second, is, um, is this sort of rule, OK? If we have a type from t1 to t2, OK? This is a function from t1 to t2. We can, at any time, say, OK, there exists an x such that t2. We can, this, is, this is kind of a, a way of, of um, type, narrow, uh, type uh, broadening, rather, OK? Exists an x such that t2. We've thrown away some information in this type signature. And that's what we're doing with the exist type. So here's the question. Why on earth would it be useful to take information away from you, the developer, right? Why is it useful to have our types hide more than they have to? Well, what is the essence of modularity? Information hiding, all right? This is what we do to manage complexity in our code bases, is we take information and we partition it off so that parts of the code base don't know about details of the other part of the code base, and we can evolve them independently. This is modularity. And what's very interesting is this is stepping on the core principles of object orientation. Now, I know this is Scala. Object oriented is a bit of a dirty word, but stick with me for a little while. Um, imagine we have this trait thing, OK? This is a, a, a somewhat general concept, um, which is why I called it thing, because that's the formal word for it. And um, so thing ha has two type parameters. One is contravariant, one is covariant, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, and it has some existential type x inside of it. And x, you can think of x as being a representation of some state inside an object. So you remember back to that first slide where I had foo, OK, the class foo that had an x and then an add function that used the state inside of foo? x, the type x here, could be that state, right? It could be an int. It could be something else. We don't know. We don't know from the outside. But we'll know on the inside, which is what matters. So we can create that state so that people can pass it around like a constructor. And we can use that state using the sync method to produce some value. And then there's, um, there's a, a morphism that we have you know, from state to state. So it's, um, you know, it's not, not too terribly complex. And the magic of Scala allows us to use this thing even though we don't know what the type is. Okay? So we can take and we can have a thing from int to string. And remember, even knowing that we have a thing from int to string, we still don't know what x is. It doesn't matter. We don't need to know what x is. We can get an x by giving source an int, right? That's the input type. And we can use that x and pass it along and then do things with that x and finally produce a result, OK? Even though we don't know what the type of x is. This is very analogous to what happens every time you use an object that has private members. It has some stuff 
inside of it, that you know, the JVM is sort of implicitly typing and carrying along with us. This is the explicit version of what the JVM does for us every time we do an object. So this concept of, of information hiding and, and modularity via existential types is actually very familiar to all of us, if you think about it. We're all doing it every day. We just don't think about it too much. Um, and the neat thing about the cake pattern is it allows us to exploit this concept in a really interesting way, okay? It allows us to take this concept of information hiding by existentiality and, ex and use it to actually have more powerful modules than what you could have otherwise. And that's really what the cake pattern is about, modularity. So um, modules. The essence of a cake pattern is a module. A trait is a module. So for the rest of the talk, we're going to assume that we have transcended the realm of packages, because packages are terrible, and nobody should be using them anymore. Um, traits are much, much more powerful, because they're composable, and they're controlled. Packages are just a fancy way of sticking prefixes on your names. They're not really a very good tool for programming. Um, so traits, traits are true modules. Um, traits allow you, unlike packages, to have explicit type-checked dependencies. Okay? We like to think that packages give us type check dependencies because if we fail to import something, we get an error. But the thing is that we can't look at the outside of a package and see all of the things that were imported. We can't compose the, uh, this package with some other package and change what was imported inside of this original package if it was imported in a specific way. We don't really have that option. Um, having dependencies explicit with traits as modules gives us that kind of flexibility, gives us that kind of power. Um, traits also give us complete encapsulation, okay? We can hide things inside of traits, not only method implementations, but also type implementations, okay? We don't have to expose even the details of the fact that there is a valid type for this particular thing, for this thingy, this X that we're working with and we're passing through our BIPI function, right? We don't need to expose those details to the consumer because the consumer of our API doesn't need to know, right? If, why would they care what our implementation type is if you know, they're, they're not going to be looking at that implementation anyway? So we can just hide it from them. It allows us a far, far, far greater degree of encapsulation than you can get with traditional package stuff. And I really think that um, Using, using um, traits in this way is how object-oriented programming was meant to be used in a language like Scala, okay? Um, now, we all know the benefits of functional programming, and I, I tend to program in a highly functional style using very, you know, sort of Haskell-ish um, abstractions and whatnot. Um, that's great, okay? And that's really important, and it has its place. But for organizing big, giant blocks, for organizing things that are logically modules, I turn back to OO. And from OO, we can get the cake pattern. And it's really, really, really nice to work with in practice. I've done it on two large code bases now. And there have been problems. But overall, it's been a phenomenally positive experience. So um, I like to think of the cake pattern, or rather the, um, the process of uh, deploying the cake pattern, as it were, in your code base um, in three stages. Okay? So stage one. This is sort of the, the intro baby steps into the cake pattern. Um, number one, split your uh, code base into top-level traits, okay? The general rule for this is, is every single file should basically have its own trait, that it just, everything in that file, indent it one more level, throw a trait around it, call it a day. Um, that's, that's basically the first thing you do. And um, this, e even that simple step, actually gives you a lot of benefits. Because in order to access the stuff that's in file A, you need to mix in its trait into file B. So now you have an explicit, documented, and type-checked dependency between A and B, whereas previously that dependency was implicit. So you've already gained a lot just by doing that. So um, if you think of traits in terms of modules, then your import mechanism is extends and width. Okay? So it's the inheritance, it's the inheritance hierarchy that you're using to do this. Um, one of the nice things about this is, um, unlike with a normal file, you can actually use bare functions inside of a trait because they're not really bare. They're, they're technically members, but you don't think of them that way because you're always inside of your, your cake. Um, so using bare functions is sometimes really nice because 
there are times where it just doesn't make any sense to put this function inside of a class because all you would be doing is wrapping the function. So you can get around this kind of this weird quirk in the, the way that the JVM works. Um, and uh, inner objects are, are very important to remember. And I'll point out why this is in a second. Um, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't feel like you have to have everything at the base scope of your trait. Right? Sometimes name collision happens. Namespacing still has its purpose. And we'll, we'll go into that in a second. So what does this look like? OK, user module. All right, user module has um, two functions inside of it and a class. We just tossed it into the trait. Um, everything is inside here. You could very easily imagine this of just living inside of a file, well, I mean, with the exception of the bare functions. And um, you know, that's how you might have organized a code base without the cake pattern. So we have our, our user module, and everything is concrete, despite the fact that it's a trait. We don't care. Um, traits, traits allow us to do that sort of implementation thing. And then we have a message module that uses user module. It imports user module. And um, message module apparently does things with users, I guess, as the, the author of a message or something like that. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of cool. Um, we brought that in. We didn't have to use import or any sort of implicit dependencies. It's all up there in the type signature. And at the end of the world, when it comes to put these together, we're guaranteed to have both of them. But we're already running into problems, specifically right there. This save function. If you remember back to the previous slide, user module also has a save function. And um, the, the compiler is going to be able to disambiguate them because the parameter type is different, in this case, message as opposed to user. But that's overloading, and that's weird and terrible and an awful holdover from the days of C++. We shouldn't be doing that if we can avoid it, right? So rather than overloading the save function, which is really unnecessary and gratuitous, um, what we can do is we can take these functions inside of message module, the things that um, are, uh, are logically relating only to message, right? So render message, save message, that sort of thing. We could just push them into an inner object. This is namespacing. Now, like five minutes ago, I said that namespacing was really bad, because all you're doing is just adding prefixes to a name. And that's true. It's bad if you're using it to implement modularity, OK? Namespacing is not modules. Namespacing is avoiding name collision. And that's precisely what we're doing here. We have a module. We have a mechanism for doing modularity. We're not using this inner object message as a way of having a module. Instead, we're just using it as a way to disambiguate. This is the render function specifically pertaining to messages. So this is a really, really, really good use of objects. And one of the nice things about this is that unlike packages, objects are actual things. Okay, They're objects. You can put them in vals. You can rename them. You can carry them around. You can pass them along. It's, um, they, they behave just like everything else in Scala. So um, by using objects rather than packages, we're actually um, getting away from one of the more peculiar dichotomies inside of Scala held over from the JVM and the way that the JVM works. So that's stage one, OK? Uh, and uh, the way that this, this story usually works is you go through your code base, you implement things in this way, life is wonderful and happy, and then you start running into problems, OK? Um, one of the problems you might run into is testing. Um, a lot of people like to test things. Apparently, unit testing is good. And um, it's, as we all know, it can be very difficult to test some sort of high-level module that's using a couple of other modules underneath it where maybe one of those modules talks to some remote service or does something really complicated. And you don't want to test that module. You want to test the higher-level module instead. So we get into mocking and things like that. And anybody who's done mocking in a large-scale system with maybe Spring or some other dependency injection framework knows what a pain that can be. The cake pattern gives us a really, really, really nice way of doing this, as you would expect. Remember, we're working with traits. Our modules are traits. We can just as easily make our functions inside our traits abstract. We can have abstract functions inside our traits and then concrete implementations somewhere else. And our modules that depend on the module that we care about can depend on the trait that has the abstract form rather than the concrete form. This allows us to create multiple concrete forms, not only one for our production system, but also maybe one for our dev system, and one for our test suite, and one for whatever. It gives us all of that flexibility. Um, the uh, precog code base is exploiting this to the nth degree. It's, it's crazy how much we're doing with this. We can swap out our storage backend just at the drop of a hat because it's very, very, very well modularized. 
And it's done using this trick. So make your functions abstract, OK? Um, I still, when I'm building a new module, I start with a concrete function, but I very, very, very quickly move to the abstract form. The more um, interesting point on this slide is not refactor your functions to be abstract, but refactor your types to be abstract, OK? You don't have to settle for concrete types. This is the beauty, the real, real beauty of Scala's abstract type mechanism. We can actually abstract over our types in a way that you cannot do if all you have is a package, OK? And this is a really, really, really interesting concept. So all of you out there who are yearning for the good old days of Gbadia, I know there's at least one of you. Um, this is how you get virtual classes in Scala. And it is just as powerful as you would expect it to be. Um, type bounds. Type bounds are really, really powerful. You can use them to successively refine your abstract types and basically have virtual types where the definition is split across multiple modules, um, which is pretty cool. Um, Lifecycle management. This is a perennial problem with the cake pattern. Okay? You have a module. More importantly, you have several modules. And you know, because we live in an impure universe, those modules have to set things up. Okay? When they start, they have to have some sort of startup routine. They have to generally side effect. It's terrible. Um, and uh, when they're done, they have to shut themselves down. Okay? This is a really, really, really important thing. And people start out with the cake pattern by throwing this setup logic inside the constructors, which is a disaster. Like, do not ever put side effects inside of trait constructors. You will want to kill yourself. It's terrible. Um, rather than putting it in the constructors, there's a different way we can do this using um, what I believe Artima called the stackable traits pattern, okay? Which is basically the most misunderstood modifier in the entire Scala language, and we'll get to what that means in just a second. So coming back to our user module, let's see how we would progress through this second stage, okay? So um, we've got our user module, and what we've done is we've made the login method and the save method abstract. So now we're, we no longer have the details in this user module of how login works, of how authentication or anything like that works. It's just the abstract type signature. It gives us the function. We can work with it, but we don't know. We're not tied to whatever details of you know, the auth backend or any of that stuff. Okay? Um, and then uh, we could have maybe an implementation on top of MongoDB or something like that that actually does the authentication. And our message module, okay, the external module is bringing in the abstract user module. We never, ever, 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 ever want to depend upon the Mongo user module. We want to depend upon user module, because user module gives us only and exactly as much information as we want. Remember, this comes back to the essence of modularity, information hiding. We want to hide the details of MongoDB and all of its stuff. We want to hide that away, because message module doesn't care. It only cares about login and save. So um, I mean, that's, that's, that's great, but what if we wanted to have our save function on the user object? Right? We are technically in an object-oriented language. Rather than having a save function that takes the user, we could just have the save function be a no arg function on user itself, returning unit, because we side effect like a boss. So um, this, is, this is cool. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not really, I mean, it's breaking our abstraction, right? Um, user module here, remember, is the abstract form. If we had looked at the code that I alighted there, it has an abstract login function, okay? Totally abstract. The details of how to save a user are not in this module. So we could, A, do some absolutely terrible inversion of control thing and have, like, a protected abstract function that actually does the saving work that we sort of stuff in user module and then we delegate to that from save, that is a terrible idea. We don't have to do that. Rather than doing that, what we can do is we can make the concept of a user abstract. So this is a really interesting thing. Um, it basically looks like this. We have an abstract type user, which is constrained to extend user-like. And then user-like is a trait, OK? This is the abstract class that, user, uh, that, that basically defines the signature of user. And apparently, users have an ID and a name, and they have this save function. And you'll also notice user-like has a self-type. It's constrained to be a user. That doesn't actually matter in this case, because none of these functions are implemented. But if any of these functions did something like return this, 
then we would really need this. So just get yourself in the habit of doing this anytime you do virtual classes. And then finally, down at the bottom, we have an abstract constructor for user that takes an ID and a name, and it returns something of type user. This is really interesting. It returns something of type user. User is abstract. So people can use this module. They can bring in user module, and they can actually work with the user type without having any idea what its implementation is. Not only not knowing what the implementation of its methods look like, but not even knowing what the actual implementation type happens to be. All of that is hidden. We have abstraction at the method level. We have abstraction at the type level. And this is so powerful. Very, 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 very powerful. When we go to implement this, it's pretty much what you would expect. We have the Mongo user module, and it just defines a class, user. Okay? It extends user-like, does its thing, um, defines the constructor, and away we go. And this is sufficient to implement the virtual class. It actually finalizes the virtual class in the hierarchy. So this is the implementation when you have a Mongo user module. But you never have a Mongo user module. All you have is a user module. So you're working with user in an abstract form. So this is, this is really a very, very interesting bit. And we start to see how this is getting closer and closer to that existential type concept that I talked about at the beginning, where we're hiding information, not just hiding it by you know, shoving it over here or putting it in a closure or something like that. We're actually hiding it at the type level in a way that is type constrained. And we can talk about and we can reason about. Very, 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 very powerful. So I promised to talk about life cycle. Life cycle you know, you can start off by having this very simple concept here, okay? We have a lifecycle module um, that uh, has a startup and a shutdown method, okay? This seems fairly reasonable. Um, and uh, the concept that we're going to go for is uh, any module that needs to have a startup or shutdown routine is going to have to implement these functions. So rather than putting that logic in something like the constructor or, heaven forbid, the finalizer, um, we're actually going to put it in these functions so that we have some control over it. The problem is we may have multiple modules that have setup or teardown routines, right? Um, we don't want each module to have to delegate to every other module because that's a ridiculous amount of tangling. What we really want is we want to somehow say, hey, I have a startup routine. I want to do some thingy. But as part of this startup routine, I want to start up everything else that wants to be started. And I don't care what that everything else is. I just want to do it, OK? This is the purpose of the abstract override modifier, OK? Um, I don't know about you, but when I, when I was reading the Scala spec and I found the fact that you can use abstract together with override, I thought it was a typo. Uh, this doesn't make, <laughs> even looking at it, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. Um, basically, what abstract override allows you to do is access the super pointer, which is not really a pointer. It's just a namespace thingy, but whatever. It allows you to access super inside of a trait. So um, this, is, this is our team's stackable traits pattern. Basically, what we're doing here is exactly what I described. We have some init Mongo thingy function, which is a, you know, hidden inside of the uh, Mongo trait, hopefully, hopefully private. And um, that init Mongo thingy function is going to happen as part of the startup cycle. But the other thing that happens as part of the startup cycle for this module is we delegate to the startup cycle for every other module in the known universe. And um, the same thing for shutdown. So this ensures that we can compose together our modules. We can put them together, and they can all have their own life cycle that gets started at the same time and shut down at the same time. The only thing that is a little bit tricky about this is the exact order in which these things is, are run is not non-deterministic, but you should treat it as such, OK? It's basically going to depend on how the cake was put together, whether Mongo module came before message module or after message module in your with clause, right? Because that is actually order dependent. So that is going to determine the order that your modules start in. So it's very important to remember that you shouldn't have dependencies between lifecycle startup and teardown routines, OK? If you have a module that needs another module to be started before it starts, you have to start factoring things out in other ways. You can't just stack them together and hope that it's going to work. But in general, most modules tend to be fairly self-contained. Um, and uh, this sort of stackable lifecycle pattern actually works really, really, really well. So that's, that's basically stage two. Okay? And once you get your code pace to this level, 
um, things are actually in a really good place. Um, it, uh, it actually takes you a really long time, if ever, to start running into problems with the cake pattern in this form, okay? Um, this, is, this is, in general, most of the tools that you need. But some code bases are a little bit more advanced and or have really pathological needs, and that's when you start getting into stage three of our cake evolution. Stage three is when you realize that composition is actually pretty good after all, um, and the age-old advice to favor composition over inheritance is, eh, might be correct. Um, so uh, inheritance is really convenient, right? Um, our mechanism of import by width and extends is really, really nice. And I'm not telling you to get away from that. I'm not telling you that it has problems because it really doesn't. It doesn't have any limitations that you wouldn't expect. But there are times where you need to have composition. Basically, whenever you have a module that has some thing that it depends on, but that thing has state, which needs to be shared with other modules, okay, other things that are outside your cake or other instances of that module, Whenever you find yourself in that situation, you cannot use inheritance anymore. You have to use composition at some level. There has to be a val inside of your module that is another module, rather than bringing it in via width or extents. That sort of thing happens on occasion. Um, you also find yourself, very quickly, as soon as you hit that point, you find yourself uh, nesting modules within modules. Um, and this is where things get really, really mind-bending. Because think about traits, right? Traits are not like packages. Packages, if you nest a package within another package, it just adds to the prefix that it's putting on the name. Traits, on the other hand, are modules. They're true modules, and you can still nest them inside of each other, and what you get is not just more prefixing. You actually get more polymorphism, an axis of polymorphism that you wouldn't otherwise have. You can have things like independent life cycles this way. So you have an outer trait, an outer module, rather, that has its own startup and shutdown thing, and then inside of that, it has submodules. And those submodules may live and die and live and die and live and die many times over the lifetime of the outer module. That's fine. And you know, sometimes you actually need that to happen. Um, in order to do that, you have to nest modules within modules. And like I said, this does get a little bit brain melting. Um, so here's, here's where, it can start, where, where you can start to see what this looks like. We have a system, OK? Inside this system is a user module. And um, we're doing this because presumably um, user module is, has a life cycle that is separate from system module, okay? Um, and uh, one way to think about this, one metaphor you can use is the standard metaphor for determining whether or not to use composition or inheritance. Um, is a system a user? Well, not really. Um, so rather than having system module bring in user module via inheritance, we can bring it in via composition in this way. Um, so val user module, and this is going to be defined at some point when we put the cake together. Um, we can also just do this via standard sort of function application, take it as a parameter. It comes down to the same thing, right? It's just here we don't actually have a reference to it all over the place. Um, and um, continuing on with this, um, we to, to sort of see... Um, we, we might have um, a storage module, okay? And the storage module is part of a system module, right? We're still using inheritance because inheritance isn't evil. It's, it's still very nice and convenient. Um, so our storage module defines some abstract functions, store and retrieve, and presumably we'll define a, a concrete implementation of this at some point. Um, the problem is that we want user module to be able to access storage module. Okay, if you remember, one of the things that user module has the ability to do is save a user. It also has the ability to log in. I mean, that really implies that you have to have some access to the storage module. Well, that's a problem if you want the uh, system module to be independent in terms of life cycles from the user module. Because if you cake them together, if you just naively make them all inherit together, um, then you're tying their life cycles together and they can never be separated again. So what you do is we refactor user module, okay? User module has now become user module module because names are hard. Um, and user module module contains a user module. The, the interesting thing is that user module module is what extends storage module, okay? This is where you bring the storage module into the cake so that user module can work with it. And then user module itself is independent. You can start it up, you can shut it down, you can create any number of these modules, just pass them around like normal objects because that's what they are. 
And um, all of that works the way you would expect. So this is basically what I'm talking about when I say that traits make modules first class, because they actually take modules and make them a thing that you can get your hand around, and you can create them, and you can destroy them, and you can have parallel modules that live next to each other inside your object hierarchy. This is a really, really, really valuable property of the cake pattern, and it's something that is completely out of reach if all you're using are packages or objects. So this is great. This is really, really great. The benefits of this are profound, and, and hopefully they're st starting to become a little bit more real. Um, the, there are, unfortunately, some problems which arise when you do this. Um, it's, you know, many of them are just artifacts of the fact that we are sitting on the JVM, and it's, it can be annoying. So um, here is a classic example of a problem which can arise. How many people see the issue here? Okay, what does this program print? Uh, no, it doesn't, it doesn't throw a null pointer exception because any two string graph uh, actually does, um, it does null checking. So this actually prints null world. And uh, bar, the value of bar is null world. It's not hello world, which is really, really, really strange. Um, and th this is just like very unintuitive because everything in here is a val, right? Nothing's being reassigned. There's no point theoretically where we should be able to observe a lack of value here. The problem is we are sitting on the JVM, okay? And val is an eager construct. So basically Scala is making a hard guarantee that when it hits the val in its execution path, okay, and it's going to hit that val in the constructor for the trait, when it hits that val, it will be executed, regardless of the state of everything else in the universe, regardless of what things that val may or may not be using, and whether or not those things are available. You can actually see this problem in Java as well, and it is the source of perennial threads on Stack Overflow, because people just find this very confusing. Basically what's happening is the constructor for C, the class, is running, okay? And the very first thing that constructor does is it delegates to A's constructor, all right? Delegates to A's constructor. A's constructor doesn't have anything, so it delegates to B's constructor. Now, B's constructor has bar, and this is where the problem is. Bar accesses foo and concatenates it with the string world. Foo has not yet been created because C's constructor hasn't run yet. C's constructor is in the process of delegating to its super constructor. The super constructor delegated back down to some state that's set up inside of the sub constructor, and that's where you start having problems. So um, this, this arises astoundingly frequently when you use traits, and since the cake pattern is all about traits, yeah, you're, you're going to see this a lot. Um, generally speaking, whenever you have side effects or eager evaluation, which is another form of side effect. So um, yeah, this is an initialization order problem. Uh, and most often, it shows up as a really strange null pointer exception. A null pointer exception that's happening in a part of the code which cannot possibly have a null pointer exception. When the laws of physics appear to evaporate, suspect initialization order. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's really the general rule that I can give you. Um, unexpected JVM zeros in general, like it's not always null. You could have false or you could have zero, right, if it's an int or a long. Those sorts of things just pop up and you have to deal with them. It's very strange and very difficult to debug. Um, and sometimes it can just tie you in knots trying to figure out how to linearize your hierarchy in a sane way. Um, really just anytime you see behavior that you can't explain. So there is a very interesting bug in the Quirrell parser inside the precog code base that I have yet to explain. And basically, um, there is a val, which is not abstract. It's inside of a trait, but it's not abstract. It's not inherited. It's just a val. It could, for all intents and purposes, be a private val. And I think it may actually be now. If I keep that as a val, even though it's never used in the constructor, never accessed in the constructor hierarchy, the parser doesn't work. It doesn't crash, it just parses the wrong thing. I have to make it a lazy val in order to make the parser function. I have no idea why this would be the case. Absolutely none. It doesn't make any sense to me. So um, basically, just the, the solution to this in general is you throw up a def instead of a val, or you use a lazy val, 
and lazy eval makes, it la makes uh, your eager uh, evaluation a lazy evaluation and, um, and kind of gets around that problem. You need to be very, very careful with this, though, okay? Um, there's, a, there's an interesting problem <laughs> in the Scala compiler itself, Scala C's source code, where um, they're using the cake pattern, okay? Um, they, they designed their cake a long time ago before the community kind of built up all this received wisdom about the cake pattern, but it's still, you know, the essence of it is the cake pattern. And they have a lot of symbols that are pointers that the compiler needs to know about. The things like, what is the name of the class object? What is the name of the class string? What are the boxing classes for integers and booleans, et cetera, right? The compiler needs to know about those symbols internally. So it needs to have a giant trait that has all of those symbols. The problem is that the notion of a symbol is something that's defined inside the Scala C cake. So you can't create those symbols without the cake being set up. So Scala C actually has a trait that has literally hundreds of lazy vowels inside of it. And until they made those lazy vowels eagerly, um, eagerly populate themselves by using a special function that they called, um, the, the, the initialization time amortized over all of those lazy vowels was in the tens of seconds. It was insane, absolutely insane. So um, lazy val is a real performance problem. If you care about performance at all, don't use it in a hot path. And if you care about your sanity, don't use it if you can avoid it. The problem is that the cake pattern makes it really hard to avoid. So use death if you can, use lazy val if you have to. Yeah. I don't know, there's, there's no good answer to this. Um, so this is basically the modification that we make. We make foo an abstract death, we make bar a lazy val, and this problem goes away. Here's another good one. Um, there's actually no code on this screen, so you, there's no real problem here. Um, and the reason is that I haven't been able to minimize this bug at all, but it seems to arise when I have situations like this. Uh, basically, what happens in situations like this, some of the time, is you have initialization order for these constructors, for like, the, foo, the, the more dot foo constructor and the more dot baz constructor, sometimes if they depend on each other or one depends on the other, you can actually get a deadlock in a single threaded program initializing this code. It's, it's mad insanity. I have no idea what's going on here. Basically the problem is that um, object stuff and object more, they're objects. So they have locks inside of them that are used to um, linearize their construction, right? Because objects are singletons, so they have to have locks inside of them, otherwise if you create them concurrently, you could end up with multiple instances. So those locks can sometimes get deadlocked with the locks of the inner objects inside of them, depending on the order that things get accessed in. And this can be a real, real hair raiser. Um, it happens a lot when you have objects within objects within objects within objects, especially if there's a lazy valve sitting at the top. So um, this, this has bitten us a few times. Um, basically, the way you recognize this problem, deadlocks. Seems obvious. Um, just do a stack dump. If you, see a dead, if, if you see a deadlock in your program initialization, especially if it's a non-deterministic deadlock in your program initialization, um, you might have a lock order issue with your objects. Very, very, very peculiar. Uh, the solution, val instead of lazy val. Yay, Scala. Uh, you, just, you just have to be really careful about which one of these you're using. In general, lazy val is the right thing to do because it avoids the init order problems, but it creates init order problems with the locking because lazy val is just like object. So um, base, the, the, the trend that we have followed um, in using the cake pattern at precog is um, we, we start off with death. And then when we discover that creating a bazillion of these things is a bad idea, we move to lazy val. And then when we discover that things are getting deadlocked on this particular lazy val, we move to val. And then we discover that that val is null sometimes in the initialization pattern. And then we cry and generally move back to lazy val very carefully. Um, so it's this, it's this horrifying, horrifying cycle. Um, be very careful of these two. <laughs> these two play off each other in horrible ways. Um, and basically, as they, you know, the transformation is, is trivial. Other issues you're going to run into using the cake pattern, compilation time sucks. This is true of Scala in general. It's more true if you're using the cake pattern. The Quirrell compiler was at one point nine source files that took three and a half minutes to compile. Uh, 
yeah, SBT is great, okay? If it were not for the incremental compiler, I would have wasted man years. Um, but sometimes, like, even SBT can't filter all of this stuff out, and it has to recompile the universe, and it, it can be terrible. Compilation bugs. Uh, surprise, Scala C has bugs in it. And uh, you will hit a lot of these bugs when doing really dodgy things with the type system, where dodgy means more complicated and, and existential. Um, the presentation compiler is a really big offender here. The presentation compiler still does not work correctly with the cake pattern. So if you're using Ensign, put it on the shelf, um, because the cake pattern is going to destroy your type errors. Uh, the not presentation compiler isn't very much happier sometimes. Um, I've gotten type errors that are just utterly bizarre, and, and sometimes you just have to work with it. Um, SBT also has some issues with this. Um, I think they have been resolved in more recent versions of SBT, but in uh, SBT 0.11, um, there's this really hilarious problem where incremental recompilation of things that don't need to be recompiled can sometimes cause them to change or can sometimes leave stale class files lining around that then get caked together and don't break but cause your program to have the wrong semantics, which is the best thing ever, right? You, you run your program and then you get the wrong answer and you're trying to figure out why and it just turns out that you had stale class files. Really bizarre. Finally, um, ScalaDoc is, is, yeah, um, ScalaDoc doesn't deal with the cake pattern very well. So if you care at all about um, API documentation, this is, uh, this is something to be aware of. So um, I have some slides that, that dig into best practices and things that I think are important, but uh, I think uh, we're, we're running short on time, so I'd rather open it up for questions at this point. So the question is, do we use packages at all, or um, do we just have one big flat one? And the answer is yes, we do use packages. Um, we use them as name prefixes. Um, so it's just, it's easier to organize things, yeah, organize the modules themselves using packages because, I don't know, then your namespace is a little cleaner when you're trying to cake things together. And I, I think we could very easily do without packages and it wouldn't be too much of a big deal. So I'm not using self-types, I'm using extends. Um, the reason for this is extends is a lot more controlled. Um, extends and width, you actually have a sane ordering. You can actually put things together in whatever order you want. Um, I was talking with Roland about this earlier today, actually. Um, self-types self -types have a tendency to, to put the uh, thing you're extending first, which can mess up your linearization um, and can make things a little bit surprising sometimes in the order that they're put together. Um, there's also the fact that um, with self-types, you really can't have more than one. So self-types only make sense when you are trying to say, I am a this, right? I'm always going to be a this, and this is the one thing I'm going to be. Um, so I use them with virtual classes because I think with virtual classes, they semantically make sense. But for actual caking of things together, I think extends and width are more powerful and more controlled. So have we thought about using abstract classes and early initializers to, to solve the problems of initialization? Answer, yes, and we do. Um, and I didn't have time to talk about it. Yeah, so that, that's, like the, that's like the nuclear option to this, is take your trait and turn it into an abstract class. Um, Problems with Scala C 2.9 or 2.10. Um, right now, the precog code base is on 2.9.3 or whatever the latest is. Um, we haven't upgraded to 2.10 yet. Um, I have seen a lot of these issues with 2.10. When we find bugs, what we try to do is we try to minimize them so that we can know what to do in our code base. And then I, tend, I try to take it against the latest master of Scala C and reproduce it as well. Um, most of the bugs that we have run into have been reproducible against Scala 2.10, though some of them have been fixed now. The initialization problems, the performance problems, the locking problems are identical between objects and lazy vowels. That is correct, which is why that slide is so hilarious. So to get around the, the early init problem, you have to use lazy vowel or object. But to get around the locking problem, you have to use val. So um, yes, they are in conflict, and sometimes that really ties you in, in circles. Okay. Thank you very, very, very much for your time. <laughs>